Welcome to the Accessibility Standards Training eModule. This training is a mandatory requirement under the Accessibilities for Ontarians with Disabilities Act and covers both the Accessible Customer Service Standard and the Integrated Accessibility Standard. You may pause the training at any point and even stop this session and restart it at a more convenient time. Before we start, I would like you to take a few seconds to picture someone you know that has a disability. And while you venture through this e-module, imagine how these changes will affect this family member, friend, co-worker, or neighbor. The training will include the following. An overview of accessibility in Ontario, different types of disabilities, legislative background, the customer service standard requirements under the AODA, including tips for customer service, the integrated accessibility standard requirements under the AODA specific to information and communication, employment, transportation, and the design of public spaces. We'll also talk about changes to the building code and the town's accessibility policies and multi-year accessibility plan. Did you know that approximately 1.8 million Ontarians have some form of disability? That's 15.5%. Based on Fort Erie's population of 30,000, we have approximately 4,650 residents that have some form of disability. As we are all living longer lives, these figures will increase as the percentage of an older population grows. By 2036, approximately 20% of all Canadians will have some form of disability. Presently, the spending power of persons with disabilities is between 21 and 25 billion dollars a year in Canada alone. So let's talk about some of the different types of disabilities. The more familiar forms include physical, hearing, vision, deafblind, speech, mental health and learning disabilities. But did you know that there are other forms like intellectual, sensory, which affect taste, smell, or touch, and other conditions such as chronic pain, chronic fatigue, cancer, severe allergies, diabetes, and asthma. There are also temporary disabilities that may occur due to accidents or short-term illnesses. So that person that I asked you to think about in the beginning, what may they have difficulty doing on a daily basis? Was it someone who may have had asthma or diabetes? More than likely not. Often when we think of a person with a disability, we think of someone with physical limitations or mobility challenges. But as you can see, there are many other forms of disability, some that are not so visible. It's always important to remember that you're not dealing with the disability, you're dealing with the person. The Human Rights Code for years has provided a duty to accommodate for persons with disabilities. The Ontarians with Disabilities Act 2001, also known as the ODA, was developed to improve the opportunities for people with disabilities by identifying and removing barriers to full participation. This act requires that a municipality with a population over 10,000 must develop an annual accessibility plan, consult with people with disabilities to develop the plan, make the plan available to the public, and have an accessibility advisory committee. The Town of Fort Erie's Accessibility Advisory Committee was established by the ODA and this legislation has made great strides for Ontario. However, the legislation has been strictly limited to the public sector. In order to broaden the scope of accessibility requirements throughout the province, the AODA, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, was introduced in 2005. The purpose of this legislation is to achieve a fully accessible Ontario by 2025. So how will this accessible Ontario be achieved? By developing accessibility standards, enforcing those standards, and by applying the standards not only across the public and broader public, but also includes private sector requirements. So no longer is it only the public sector that has to be accessible. The AODA legislation required the development of five standards that affect some of the most important aspects of a person's life. 
The five standards that were developed are customer service, employment, information and communication, transportation, and design of public spaces. All of the standards were developed by standards councils that were made up of 50% of persons with disabilities and 50% of people from the specific industries. Our Accessibility Advisory Committee was also requested to comment on each of the draft standards that were provided. While these standards will help achieve a barrier-free Ontario and may seem difficult to achieve, just think back 20 years ago when no smoking laws were first introduced and how far we've come since then. So let's talk about accessible customer service. The first standard to be introduced into law in July 2007 was the Accessible Customer Service Standard. This standard requires that an accessible customer service policy, procedures and practices be developed. That all staff be trained in accessible customer service. This includes volunteers and board members. That a feedback method be developed. Alternate communication methods be made available and that the public be notified of any service disruption. On May 19, 2009, Council endorsed the Accessible Customer Service Standard Policy. This policy laid out the principles of accessible customer service. It also included assistive devices, information on service animals, support persons, the notice of service disruptions, and training requirements and feedback. The legislation also included compliance and enforcement requirements. All sectors had to comply within specific time frames. For municipalities our size, that date was January 1, 2010. For private sector companies, the compliance date was January 1, 2012. All were also required to submit accessibility reports. Inspectors also have been appointed to verify compliance and there are penalties associated with non-compliance. So what is accessible customer service? It is flexible service that meets the needs of an individual customer. Always putting the person first. So we don't say that deaf man, we say that man who is deaf. Always put the person first. Understanding that some methods of service may not work for all people. Allowing for comments and suggestions on how to improve accessible customer service and providing as much notice as possible if there is a disruption in service. Staff can expect requests such as, I can't read that agenda, can you provide it in a larger font please? Oftentimes we may just hand someone a paper and pen and say, fill this out, but they may have a visual, hearing or intellectual disability. They may have arthritis and are unable to hold a pen. Do not wait until you see someone struggle. Just simply say, let me know if you need assistance. There are four main principles of accessible customer service. Dignity, services provided in a respectful manner consistent with the needs of the individual. Independence, services for persons with disabilities shall support their independence while respecting their right to safety and personal privacy. Integration. Services allow people with disabilities to fully benefit from the same services in the same place and in the same or similar way as other customers. Equal opportunity. Service outcome is the same for persons with disabilities as for persons without disabilities. When developing the accessible customer service policy, the town also included these additional principles when dealing with all customers. Sensitive. Services provided in a manner that is respectful to an individual's needs. Responsive. Services delivered in a timely manner, considering the nature of the service and the accommodation required. And inclusive. Committed to an inclusive environment as one where people experience both the feeling and reality of belonging and where as a result they are able to fulfill their full potential. When interacting with the public, remember the acronym TALK. T. Take the time to ask, may I help you? A. Ask. Don't assume. 
Never assist unless you're asked. L. Listen. Listen attentively and speak directly to the customer. And K. Know the accommodations and special services that are available. Other key things to remember when interacting with a person with a disability. If you notice someone having difficulty accessing our goods and services, a good starting point is just to simply ask, how can I best help? Be patient and remember your customer is the best source of information about what they need. The solution can be simple and they will likely appreciate your attention and consideration. Being able to interact and communicate with people with disabilities is a big part of providing accessible customer service. The next several slides will provide insight into the different types of disabilities and provide some helpful customer service tips that you can use as a guide. Physical disability. Physical disabilities include a range of functional limitations from minor difficulties in moving or coordinating one part of the body through muscle weakness, tremors, and paralysis. They can be congenital, such as muscular dystrophy, or acquired, such as tendinitis. A physical disability may affect an individual's ability to perform manual tasks, such as holding a pen, turning a key, or gripping a doorknob. They may not be able to move around independently or control the speed or coordination of their movements. They may not be able to reach, pull, or manipulate an object or have strength or endurance. Remember these suggestions when dealing with someone with a physical disability. Wheelchairs and other mobility devices are part of a person's personal space. Don't touch, move, or lean on them. If you need to have a lengthy conversation with someone who uses a wheelchair or scooter, consider sitting so you can make eye contact at the same level. Keep ramps and aisleways free of clutter. If a counter is too high or wide, step around it to provide service. And provide seating for those that cannot stand in line. Hearing loss can cause problems in distinguishing certain frequencies, sounds, or words. A person who is deaf, oral deaf, deafened, or hard of hearing may be unable to use a public telephone, understand speech in a noisy environment, or pronounce words clearly enough to be understood by strangers. Remember these suggestions when dealing with someone who may have a hearing loss. Attract the customer's attention before speaking. Try a gentle touch on the shoulder or a wave of your hand. Make sure you are in a well-lit area where your customer can see your face and read your lips. If your customer uses a hearing aid, reduce background noise or move to a quieter area. Deaf people may use a sign language interpreter to communicate. Always direct your attention to the deaf person, not the interpreter. If necessary, write notes back and forth to share information. But just remember that English may not be that person's first language. American Sign Language differs in structure from English. An example is, we may ask, where are you going? Versus someone signing, you going where you? Is how it's translated into English. So writing out information can sometimes cause confusion if a person's first language is ASL, American Sign Language. Face the person and keep your hands and other objects away from your face and mouth. Don't shout and speak clearly. Vision loss can restrict someone's ability to read, locate landmarks, or see hazards. Some customers may use a guide dog or a white cane while others may not. Visual disabilities range from slightly reduced visual acuity to total blindness. Vision loss can result in difficulty reading or seeing faces, difficulty maneuvering in unfamiliar places, an inability to differentiate colors or distances, a narrow field of vision, the need for bright light or contrast, or night blindness. Remember these suggestions when dealing with someone who may have a vision loss. Identify yourself when you approach your customer and speak directly to them. Don't assume the individual can't see you. Many people who have low vision still have some sight. If the person uses a service animal, do not touch or approach the animal. It is working. Verbally describe the setting, form, and location as necessary. Be precise and descriptive. And offer your elbow to guide the person. Do not grab or pull. Speech disabilities involve the partial or total loss of the ability to speak. 
Typical speech disabilities include problems with pronunciation, pitch and loudness, hoarseness or breathiness, stuttering or slurring. Some helpful suggestions include not assuming that a person with a speech impairment has another disability. If possible, communicate in a quiet environment. Give the person your full attention. Be patient. Don't interrupt or finish their sentences. Whenever possible, ask questions that can be answered with a yes or no. Ask the individual to repeat as necessary or write their message. And then verify your understanding back to the individual. Deaf blindness is a combination of hearing and vision loss. The result for a person who is deaf blind is significant difficulty accessing information and performing daily activities. Deaf blindness interferes with communication, learning, orientation, and mobility. People who are deaf blind communicate using various sign language systems, braille, telephone devices, communication boards, and any combination thereof. Many people who are deaf blind use the services of an intervener who will relay information and facilitate auditory and visual information and act as sighted guides. The intervener will sign on the individual's hand. Some tips to keep in mind include directing your attention to your customer, not the intervener. A customer who is deaf blind is likely to explain how to communicate with them, perhaps with an assistance card or note. Understand that communication can take some time. Please be patient. Mental health issues can affect a person's ability to think clearly, process new information, concentrate, or remember things. Mental health disabilities include a range of disorders that can differ in severity. For example, some custo customers may experience anxiety due to hallucinations, mood swings, phobias, or panic disorder. There are three main types of mental health disability, anxiety, mood, and behavioral. People with mental health disabilities may seem edgy or irritated. They may act aggressively or be perceived as pushy or abrupt. They could also be reserved and quiet, especially if in a new, uncertain environment. They may be unable to make a decision. They may start laughing or get angry for no apparent reason. Some suggestions in providing customer service to someone with a mental health disability include treating each person as an individual with the same respect and consideration you have for everyone else. Ask what would make him or her the most comfortable and respect the needs to the maximum extent possible. Being confident, calm, and reassuring also helps. Try to reduce stress and anxiety in situations. Stay calm and courteous. Even if the customer exhibits unusual behavior, focus on the service they need and ask them to tell you the best way to help. You may also want to take the individual away from the situation and noise and distractions to facilitate one-on-one -on -one service. Learning disabilities include a variety of disorders that affect how a person takes in or retains information and how they understand and process the information. Learning disabilities can result in difficulties in reading, problem solving, time management, wayfinding, and processing information. The disability may become apparent when a person has difficulty reading material or understanding the information you are providing. Consider these suggestions for providing accessible customer service to someone with a learning disability. Learning disabilities are generally invisible and the ability to function varies greatly. Respond to any requests for verbal information, assistance on filling in forms, and so on with courtesy. Be patient. People with some learning disabilities may take a little longer to process information, to understand, and to respond. Allow extra time to complete tasks if necessary. Try to provide information in a way that takes into account the person's disability. For example, some people with learning disabilities find written words difficult to understand, while others have problems with numbers and math. Intellectual or developmental disabilities can limit a person's ability to learn, communicate, do everyday physical activities, and live independently. You may not know that someone has this disability unless you are told. It could be caused by genetic factors such as Down syndrome, exposure to environmental toxins such as fetal alcohol syndrome, brain trauma, or psychiatric disorders. A person with an intellectual disorder may have difficulty with understanding spoken and written information. 
conceptual information, perception of sensory information, and memory. Some suggestions to assist include do not make assumptions about what a person can and cannot do. Use clear, simple, plain language. Be prepared to explain and provide examples regarding information. Remember that the person is an adult and unless you are informed otherwise, they can make their own decisions. Provide one piece of information at a time. Be patient and again verify your understanding. Sensory disabilities include smell, touch, and taste. Smell disabilities can involve the inability to sense smells or a hypersensitivity to odors and smells. A person with a smelling disability may have allergies to certain odors, scents, chemicals, or may be unable to identify dangerous gases, smoke, fumes, and spoiled food. Touch disabilities can affect a person's ability to sense texture, temperature, vibration, or pressure. Touch sensations may be reduced or heightened, resulting in a hypersensitivity to touch, temperature, or the opposite, numbness and the inability to feel touch sensations. Taste disabilities can limit the experience of the four primary taste sensations, sweet, bitter, salty, and sour. A person with a taste disability may be unable to identify spoiled food or noxious substances. Other disabilities result from a range of conditions, such as accidents, illnesses and diseases including ALS, asthma, diabetes, cancer, HIV AIDS, environmental sensitivities, seizure disorders, heart disease, stroke, and joint replacement. Temporary disabilities result from a range of other conditions, accidents, seizure disorders, heart disease, stroke, and joint replacement are a few examples. So how do you interact with a person who uses an assistive device? An assistive device is a tool, technology, or other mechanism that enables a person with a disability to do everyday tasks and activities such as moving, communicating, or lifting. Personal assistive devices can include things like wheelchairs, scooters, walkers, braces, computer software programs, hearing aids, glasses, special adapted pen or pencil, white canes, or speech amplification devices. Some suggestions, suggestions for providing accessible customer service to an assistive device user includes not touching or handling any assistive device without permission not moving an assistive device or equipment such as cane, walkers, out of your customer's reach. Offer them a place to put their device within easy reach. And letting your customer know about accessible features in the immediate environment that are appropriate to their needs, such as an elevator or accessible washroom. How to interact with people who require the assistance of a support person. Some people with disabilities may be accompanied by a support person. A support person can be a personal support worker, an interpreter, a volunteer, a family member, or even a friend. A support person might help your customer with a variety of things from communicating to helping with mobility, personal care, or medical needs. According to the Accessible Customer Service Standard and the town's policy, a support person must be allowed to accompany an individual with a disability to any part of our premises that is open to the public or to third parties. If admission to an event is permitted and fees are payable to the town, the support person is permitted at no cost. If the fees are payable to a third party, the support person is permitted to attend the event at their own cost. Please see the town's policy for further information regarding the safety of customers and when a support person may be necessary. Tips for customer service include, if you're not sure which person is the customer, take your lead from the person using or requesting the goods or service, or simply ask. Speak directly to your customer and not to their support person. How do you interact with a person who has a disability and requires the assistance of a guide dog or other service animal? People with vision loss may use a guide dog, but there are other types of service animals as well. Hearing alert animals help people who are deaf, deafened, oral deaf, or hard of hearing. 
Other service animals are trained to alert an individual to an oncoming seizure. Service animals are not always guide dogs and may be a cat, a snake, or even a ferret. These types of service animals are rare but are often used for people with a mental health disability in order to provide assurance and a calming effect. Under the Accessible Customer Service Standard, service animals are allowed on the parts of the premises that are open to the public or to other third parties, unless the animal is otherwise excluded by law. You may ask a person for a letter from a physician or nurse verifying that their animal is required for reasons related to their disability, if it is not readily apparent. There has been some comments regarding allergies to animals and how that may affect someone providing service to an individual with a service animal. In most cases, allergies occur when the animal is physically on top of them. Many of your customers and even co-workers come in every day with dog or cat hair on them. Just ensure that you are separated physically, usually by way of a wicket, if you have concerns. In most cases, service animals wear a harness stating that they are a service animal. Some tips for customer service include, remember that a service animal is not a pet. It is a working animal. Avoid touching or addressing service animals. Remember they are working and have to pay attention at all times. Avoid making assumptions about the animal. If you're not sure if the animal is a pet or a service animal, simply ask the customer. Provide the location of fresh water for the service animal and where the service animal may be walked to relieve themselves. Part of the accessible customer service and the integrated standard is to allow feedback from our customers. We need to provide customers with the opportunity to give us feedback so we can learn and improve our services. Feedback may be provided by a person with a disability in the manner deemed most convenient to them, such as in person, by telephone, in writing, or by delivering electronic text by email, or on a diskette, or otherwise. Feedback may be provided directly to the service provider or addressed to the Town of Fort Erie clerk. All feedback will be kept in strict confidence and used to improve our customer service. In addition, the author of the feedback will be provided a response in the format in which the feedback was received, outlining actions deemed appropriate. Alternative formats and communication methods. Alternative formats include providing large print versions of a document or sending it electronically so that a person's screen reader can read the text of them, having a document translated into braille, or having a sign language interpreter present during a meeting. Closed captioning is also an option, as well as audio, such as this training video that provides large print, as well as an audio message. You can also help your customer by reading the information out loud, writing down instructions, or drawing a diagram. It's important to remember, you're not being asked to provide a new or different service, just to provide the service you offer suited to the individual based on their needs. Be patient, be clear, be concise, and be respectful. The Notice of Service Disruption is also another requirement of the Accessible Customer Service Standard. Any disruption to services, planned or unplanned, have to be posted at all pertinent locations including the website, reception desks or customer service counters, entrance doors and with delivery agents where applicable. Lead facility staff and departmental administration will keep a template on hand to fill in details and post immediately. The notice will include the name of the event or service, the normal service location being impacted, alternate service locations, alternate service methods, hours of service availability, contact information, and any other information deemed appropriate to deliver the good or service. Now let's discuss the Integrated Accessibility Standard Regulation. On June 3, 2011, Ontario Regulation 191-11 was approved and provided compliance requirements for the Information and Communication, Employment and Transportation Standards. Following the introduction of the Customer Service Standard, 
which we just learned about, it became apparent that the standards had a number of general requirements in common. And so the government combined these three standards to create the Integrated Accessibility Standard, also known as the IASR. In December 2012, the standard was amended to include OREG 413-12, which outlined compliance requirements for the design of public spaces. General requirements of the IASR include the development, implementation, and maintenance of accessibility policies by January 1, 2013. This policy had to include a statement of organizational commitment, had to meet the needs of people with disabilities, be a written document, and be made available to the public and be available in an accessible format. Bylaw number 128-12 adopted the town's overarching accessibility policy. This also includes the accessible customer service policy that we discussed earlier. The IASR also requires the development of a multi-year accessibility plan which must also be made available in an alternative formats upon request and be posted on the website. An annual status report must also be prepared on the progress made, which also must be posted on the website. Accessibility must also be incorporated when procuring goods, services, and facilities. If you are unable to incorporate accessibility, you must explain why if you are requested. Accessibility features must be incorporated when designing or acquiring self-service kiosks. Interactive kiosks, electronic terminals for public use are examples. Training under the IASR is required for all employees, volunteers, and those developing policies, and all other persons who provide goods, services, or facilities on behalf of the corporation. Section 7 of the regulation requires training specific to the Ontario Human Rights Code. As noted under the legislative background, for years the only recourse a person with a disability had was to access the Ontario Human Rights Commission. The Integrated Accessibility Standard and the Ontario Human Rights Code work together in various ways to promote equality and accessibility. However, the Ontario Human Rights Code has primacy, meaning that Ontario laws, with few exceptions, have to follow the Ontario Human Rights Code. The goal of the code is to provide for equal rights so as to create a climate of respect where everyone feels part of the community and can contribute fully. The code says people with disabilities must be free from discrimination where they work, live and receive services and their needs must be accommodated. The code and the AODA have some important differences. Under the code, when a person with a disability needs accommodation, there is a duty to accommodate. The code applies to all organizations in Ontario, regardless of type and size. This includes owner-operator organizations without employees. It also covers volunteers and unpaid workers. The AODA sets accessibility standards that organizations must meet and applies to all organizations with one or more employees in Ontario. The AODA requirements depend on an organization's type, public, private, not-for-profit, as well as its size. The code protects people from discrimination and harassment because of past, present, or perceived disabilities. Disability itself is not a barrier, but barriers exist that can exclude people with disabilities. These include physical barriers, information and communication barriers, system barriers, or attitudinal barriers. I'd like you now to consider for a moment what you've done so far today, perhaps you browsed a newspaper on the internet or checked your email, maybe you attended a meeting or had a casual conversation with a colleague in the hall or by chatting online. So much of our world today is about information and communication, from chatting with your child before you left home this morning to reaching out to colleagues, even placing your morning coffee order. But imagine what it would be like if all of those lines of communication suddenly became blocked. If, when surfing the internet, some pages just didn't work, or when you opened up a document that you were told contains information that you need, it was unreadable. Or what if, while in the middle of a meeting, suddenly it's as if the sound is turned off? If your access to information was turned off, how would you know what's going on in the world around you? How would you make decisions? Instead of finding information that will allow you to participate, 
all you find is barriers. The good news is that there are solutions to information and communication barriers. For example, technology. For people without disabilities, technology makes things convenient. For people with dis disabilities, technology makes things possible, as long as they are set up right. The information and communication requirements under the IASR outline how organizations will be required to create, provide, and receive information and communication in ways that are accessible to people with disabilities. Communication is the interaction between two or more persons and is provided, sent, or received. Under the information and communication requirements, municipalities must make feedback accessible by ensuring that the process for receiving and responding to feedback is accessible upon request and notify the public that it is available. We must also make information accessible to the public. Data, facts, and knowledge that exist in any format text, audio, digital, or images that convey meaning, and this information must be provided in a timely manner that takes into account the person's accessibility needs due to their disability. We must provide it at a cost no more than regular cost to others. We must consult with the person regarding suitability of an accessible format or communication support, and we must notify the public regarding the availability of alternate formats. Town administrative staff have recently been trained on accessible document creation and have revamped the town's word templates such as letterhead, reports to council, minutes and agendas to reflect accessible best, best practices. The town's website also includes a message on the landing page that reads, The town of Fort Erie is committed to providing accessible information and communications to all of our customers. The town recognizes that people with disabilities often use methods other than standard print to access information. It is the policy of the town of Fort Erie to provide any correspondence, invoices, and other documents in an alternative format upon request. The information and communication requirements also include making emergency information accessible to the public upon request, making websites accessible based on web content accessibility guidelines, the town is presently redesigning its website and will be working with the contractor to ensure accessibility compliance requirements are met. We must also make educational materials and training resources accessible. And did you know that our public libraries, the Fort Erie Public Library, also offers various adaptive technologies such as large print keyboards, trackball pointing, devices and text-to-speech software? Public libraries are required to provide access to or arrange for accessible materials where they exist. The employment requirements for large public sector have a compliance date of 2014 and promote the hiring of people with disabilities and encourage employees to disclose a disability. The employment requirements apply to paid employees and do not apply to volunteers and other non-paid individuals such as committee members. The employment requirements have been further broken down into four sections, recruitment, assessment, selection, and retention. The Administrative Policy Directive, Accommodation and Employment, describes the accommodation procedures available to employees and applicants with disabilities to enable their participation in employment activities. Recruitment is the process of how we look for employees. In order to meet the accessibility requirements for employment, the corporation is required to notify employees about the availability of accommodation in the recruitment process, advertising internally. We must also notify the public about the availability of accommodation in recruitment process, i.e. accommodations are available upon request. And if the applicant requests an accommodation, the employer consults with the applicant to provide or arrange suitable accommodation, materials, or processes. How we assess potential employees also needs to be accessible. The process for identification and evaluation of knowledge, skills, and abilities, such as screening, interviewing, reference and police checks, physical, psychological or computer skills testing may require accommodations. We must let the selected participant know accommodations are available, including materials or processes. We must also provide or arrange accommodations, taking into account a person's needs due to disability. They can be physical, hearing, vision, deafblind, mental health, learning, 
disabilities, intellectual, sensory, and temporary disabilities. The selection process, how we choose the most likely candidate to be successful at performing a job and hiring them, also needs to be accessible and includes notifying the applicant of policies to support people with disabilities, notifying employees of policies for supporting employees with disabilities and the provision of job accommodation. New employees must be notified as soon as practicable regarding the job accommodation policy. And employees must be provided with updated information if there are any changes in the existing policies. In order to retain employees, processes must be put in place to meet the diverse needs of employees in order to create an environment that encourages employees to remain employed. The employment requirements of the IASR include accessible formats and communication supports be put in place to perform the job. Individual accommodation plans must be documented. And in dealing with performance management, activities related to assessing and improving employee performance, productivity, and effectiveness must be put in place with the goal of facilitating employee success. Career development and advancement includes additional responsibilities or moving from one job to another that may be higher in pay, have more responsibility, or be at a higher level. Return to work processes for employees absent from work due to disability and require disability related accommodations in order to return to work are also included under the retention strategy. Redeployment, the reassignment of employees to other departments or jobs within the organization as an alternative to layoff when a job or department has been eliminated will take into account accessibility needs of the individual as well. Workplace emergency response information is also required and the town did comply with that in 2012. The town of Fort Erie is considered the provider of both conventional and specialized transit even though different organizations are contracted to provide these services. The standard has several requirements that apply to both conventional and specialized transit including making information on accessibility equipment, emergency plans, features of vehicles, routes, and services available to the public. A support person is not charged a fare when a person with a disability requires a support person to accompany them on conventional or specialized transit. Conventional transit accessibility requirements include providing clearly marked courtesy seating for people with disabilities. People with disabilities cannot be charged a higher fare nor can they be charged for storing mobility aids or mobility assistive devices such as wheelchairs or walkers. This also includes taxi services. Technical requirements for lifting devices, steps, grab bars, handrails, floor surfaces, lighting and signage are also part of the IASR standard. Providing verbal and visual announcements of routes and stops on vehicles are also required under the IASR. Specialized transit accessibility requirements include developing an eligibility application process, including an independent appeal process, charging fares that are no higher than the fares charged for conventional transit, where they are both operated by the same service provider, this is known as fare parity, and the Town of Fort Erie is compliant with this requirement, providing the same hours and days of service as those offered by conventional transit, where they are both operated by the same service provider. The town also had to meet this compliance requirement and now our specialized transit known as FAST provides the same hours and service days as the conventional transit. Under the specialized transit accessibility requirements we must also construct, renovate and replace bus shelters and bus stops as required. Other transportation requirements included in the IASR are public school boards. Public school boards that provide transportation services for students must also provide integrated accessible school transportation services when possible. When it is not possible or it's not the best option for a student because of the nature of their disability or safety concerns, then the school board must provide appropriate alternative accessible transportation services. When requested, hospitals, colleges, and universities that provide transportation services must provide accessible vehicles or equivalent services. The IASR also outlines requirements for municipalities that license taxicabs. 
Those municipalities must ensure that owners and operators of taxi cabs do not charge higher fares or additional fees to a passenger with a disability. Every municipality must consult with the public to determine the proportion of accessible taxis required in their community. The Region of Niagara licenses all taxi cabs for the region and has confirmed that Fort Erie is allotted three accessible taxi cab licenses. The standard also outlines requirements for ferries that operate only within Ontario and provide passenger transportation and weigh a thousand tons or more. The goal of the accessibility standard for the design of public spaces is to remove barriers in public spaces specific to recreational trails, beach access routes, boardwalks and ramps, outdoor public use eating areas, outdoor play spaces, exterior paths of travel, accessible parking, obtaining services, service counters, fixed queuing guides and waiting areas, and the maintenance of accessible elements. The standard for public spaces only apply to new construction and planned redevelopment with a compliance date of January 1st, 2016. But I'm glad to report that our manager of parks and open space development has also consulted with the Accessibility Advisory Committee on best practices and what an accessible playground will look like. And of that, three of the most recent playgrounds that have been created for the town have included accessible criteria. Changes to the building code. Barrier-free design requirements have been part of Ontario's building code since 1975. Changes to the building code related to accessibility are contained in Ontario Regulation 368-13, which was filed on December 27, 2013, and comes into effect on January 1, 2015. The amended requirements will substantially enhance accessibility in newly constructed buildings and existing buildings that are to be extensively renovated. They maintain Ontario's leadership role and requirements for barrier-free design and cover a range of areas including requirements for visual fire alarms to be installed in all public corridors of multi-unit residential buildings and in all multi-unit residential suites, the requirement for all smoke alarms in all buildings including houses to include a visual component, requirements for an elevator or other barrier-free access to be provided between stories in most buildings with some exemptions for small residential and business occupancy buildings, requirements for power door operators to be provided at entrances to a wide range of buildings and at entrances to barrier-free washrooms and common rooms in multi-unit residential buildings, updated requirements for barrier-free washrooms and universal washrooms, requirements for barrier-free access to public pools and spas, and updated requirements for accessible and adaptable seating spaces in public assembly buildings, such as theaters, lecture halls, and places of worship. This chart provides a timeline for compliance with the accessibility standards based on the town of Fort Erie being a broader public organization with more than 50 employees. Under the general requirements of the IASR, bylaw number 128-12 was created as the Town of Fort Erie's accessibility policy. This overarching document includes the requirements of the Accessible Customer Service Standard previously contained in Administrative Policy Directive ADP 01-2009. The Town of Fort Erie's first ever multi-year accessibility plan was adopted in early 2013 and outlines the town's long-term plan to help make Ontario accessible by 2025. The plan also included consultation with persons with disabilities, the public, and the town's Accessibility Advisory Committee. We even had one of the new conventional transit buses available during the public open house to showcase the accessible features. Both of these documents are available on the town's website. Just click on Quick Links and then Accessibility. Other resources can be found on the town's intranet and website at www.forterie.on.ca. Just click on Accessibility and there you will find a guide on planning an accessible meeting, choosing the right word based on how a person with a disability prefers to be described, a one-page pamphlet that you can print out and keep at your desk, service disruption templates, feedback form, and AAC minutes and information. So thank you for participating in the Accessibility Standards Training e-module. And remember, just ask how you can help. 
Be open to working with people with disabilities to find the best solution. Accept feedback and make sure that feedback is communicated to those that can affect changes. Everyone deserves to be part of their community, to work, to play, to learn, to travel, to flourish. By making Ontario accessible, we will all have that opportunity. Thank you.